Welcome, Ron Kaufman, to the Doing CX Right Show. Thank you. Pleasure to be here. I am so happy to have this time with you. And I know it's going to go way too fast. And my audience is going to understand that very quickly. But let's start with who are you? What do you do for a living? Wow. Okay. My name is Ron Kaufman. I was born in the US, moved to Singapore 32 years ago to help a nation improve its service. So at that age, 32 years ago, why'd they pick me? Because I had a background in Ultimate Frisbee. I'm in the Ultimate Frisbee Hall of Fame. And my role was that back those years ago, when the sport was just created, I'm one of the guys that took the sport all over the world and helped to translate the rules and set up players associations and international tournaments. And I was the master of ceremonies at the World Frisbee Championship in the Rose Bowl. Okay. So when I came to Singapore, I didn't know that much about service, but I understood how do you get adults to learn something new? Mm. Like, how do you get families out into the park and teach them how to play? And the two keys are, number one, you got to get them in a good mood. Mm. And number two is you got to get them physically involved, not just intellectually involved. So I came mm -hmm. to Singapore and began, began creating games to help teach adult workers how to improve the quality of service they provided to their customers. And that one week turned into a month, turned into a year, turned into a global career of 32 years so far. What a fun fact, fun story, and how novel it is. Most people I talk to, they're transforming companies and brands. So I love how you started with a nation. Like, wow. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Amazing. Very Why? Fortunate. Why? Why such passion around the service industry and, yeah. and what you do? Yeah. I mean, again, I'll, I'll tie it back to the particular situation and case study that sort of gave me the start in the field, which is all the low-cost manufacturing in Singapore went to China. All the back office and data processing went to India. So this little country, only 5 million people, had to figure out how to be more valuable in the world, how to, how to be in the community of nations or in the neighborhood in a way that other people still wanted you to thrive. And the answer to that was, we have to help other people. We have to figure out how to be valuable to others. Mm -hmm. So they had to become either less expensive and just as good or more expensive, but better. And better had to be what mattered to the person who was actually going to be the customer of the nation. Now, politically, if you're tiny and you're in a big, you know, gnarly neighborhood, you also can't afford to have any enemies. You got to be able to make friends with everybody. And Singapore is a very multinational, multiracial, multicultural, multireligious environment where everybody needs to get along. And so that whole idea of community service, as well as customer mm -hmm. service, the whole concept of creating value for and with other people, that's what really turns me on. That's what really mm. let my fire. Mm. Mm -hmm. So you talk about customer service. Mm -hmm. I say customer experience. Mm -hmm. They're obviously very intertwined. How would you define them? What do they mean to you? Yeah, very good. I, I don't spend too much time trying to parse the fine distinctions of terminology, unless there's something that fundamentally needs a definition that hasn't yet been mm. made clear. Mm -hmm. And I first encountered that when I heard that the nation wanted to become outstanding in service and create more service value. And my question was, what do you mean by service? And I got all kinds of bad answers, like serve other people the way you would like to be served. Well, what if they're not like you? Or give other people what they want. But what if you're a medical doctor and you know that's not what they need? Or yeah. provide people with whatever they expect, but what do you do with the go-getter who says, no, we should exceed expectations? So all of that mixed up language made it very difficult to teach properly. So I actually ended up writing a definition for the word service, which goes like this. Service is taking action to create value for someone else. Hmm. Well, the moment you hear it, you go, yeah, that makes sense. And it makes sense for B2B, B2C, frontline, boardroom, supervisor, manager, taking action to create value for someone else 
internal service, external service, got it all. Okay, so then what makes something valuable? And when you say create value, well, it's an assessment that somebody who's the recipient of the service says, you know what, that contributes to my well-being. That's why I value it. Maybe you answered a question for me. Maybe you gave me an option. Maybe you gave me a recommendation. Maybe you did something that I needed to have done. But in some way, you contributed to my well-being. And so that's what made it valuable. So that's that whole definition of service. If I say customer experience, what is the experience made up of? Many, many, many moments in which someone is forming an opinion. And it could be when I'm just researching at the website, or maybe I'm going and I'm going to buy something in e-commerce or make a reservation, and then I'm going to get a confirmation, and then there's a payment, and then it's going to be delivered, and I'm going to see the packaging. And each and every one of those steps of the, along the way, we could say, well, overall, that's the journey of customer experience. And that's not wrong. But if I want to improve the customer experience, I'm going to have to go in to each of these various transactions within the journey. And within those, look at the particular, what we call perception points. In the past, they've been called moments of truth or moments of touch or whatever. I call them perception points because it's from the point of view of the person being served. Mm -hmm. So if you want to improve customer experience, what do you have to do? Well, you've got to go in and actually look at how are we serving here? How are we serving here? How are we serving here? What service experience are they having there? And then how do we make improvements? So I have two comments. One, I love how you talk about perception points because perception is reality <laughs> and people have and perceive experiences so differently. And so teams do need to come together and really understand deeply how people think, feel, perceive the brand and the experiences. So first comment, love that the way you're talking about it. Secondly, we know that people, even countries, are always protecting their turf. Silos are real in companies and it's such a pain point for me. How do you go about Getting leaders to turn a company, a culture into servicing, real service, the right way when these turfs are real, they're, they exist. Right. Yeah, very good. Very good. You're asking, really, the answer to your question opens up the big distinction between improving service performance, which is critical, and building a culture in which continuous improvement of service performance is what the culture is all about, okay? Yes. So you need both. So you could tackle, for example, an area where you're getting a lot of customer complaints by bringing together the people who are responsible for providing that particular service or CX experience. Mm -hmm. And ideally, you'd get people together across different silos who are all mutually involved in creating whatever that is. So it could be back office and front office, or it could be one department or another, or it could be headquarters and out in the field, whatever their silo may be, bring those people together. And then you've got to walk them through a method to be able to see what's going on from the recipient's point of view. And from that recipient's perception or point of view, it starts to become clear that what we're doing in the way we think about our work and our silo and our turf and our borders and our goal, da, 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 that's our process. But that's not the same as their perception. So if we want to improve their perception, we have to look at this from their point of view and then relook at the way we do what we do, including the way we do what we do with each other. Hmm. And so that can then produce a better internal service dialogue. So hmm. there you get some service performance that might cross silos. But building a culture in which that is what's happening consistently, ongoingly, well, that involves an entire architecture. Not only what are you teaching people and how are leaders understanding and guiding and protecting a culture for that, but are you recruiting the right people? Is their orientation experience what you want it to be? Are you recognizing and compensating people? How are you capturing voice of customer? It goes on and on. I call that the 12 building blocks of mm. an uplifting service culture, like building a house, which sits on a foundation of teaching people 
what they didn't learn in school, and then providing a rooftop of leaders who actually get it and role model it and support it every day. I love that you said they don't teach this in school. And it's fascinating to me as I have one in college and one graduated and they are obsessed around customer service, customer experience, because they hear me every day talk about it and they notice it and they're paying attention. And they're like, mom, why don't we learn this deeply in in school? school. I I don't understand that. I can answer that for you. I can answer that for you. Yeah, it's one of those silo situations. In other words, all academics have evolved into this narrative around is creating knowledge and creating new knowledge. And I'll stand on the shoulders of what you said, but now I'm going to say something different. My model is better than your model. And you actually, in the world of academia, you get all the way up to the point where PhDs need to defend their thesis, that they've come up with some incremental improvement in new knowledge. And then that controls budgets and that controls department rules, et cetera, et cetera. And you come down from that of the lofty heights of the ivory towers and you get to the issue of test scores, like how are schools evaluated one to the other? Mm -hmm. And there's this whole metric methodology of testing, which has nothing to do with empathy or compassion or listening skills. And so the schools are see all those other EQ related soft skill customer experience issues and talents and skills and abilities and say, oh, that's extracurricular. You know, that, 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 that's that stuff. Over here, yeah. we're focused on our test scores. So then you graduate young people out into the workforce who can't even answer the question, what does it mean to have a customer? Or what does it mean to create value or improve someone else's experience? And so that's why so much of this fundamental service education needs to occur in the workplace. But not education like theory. It's got to be actionable service education. So measurements. First of all, going back to measurements and silos. So one of the things I've noticed that part of the reason why teams, the culture breaks down is because different teams have different goals. And I remember when I worked in telecom, I was on the e-commerce team and we had a set of online digital goals, but yet the customer can buy online and pick up a store. And so this retail store had different goals. Mm-hmm. And therefore, KPIs. yeah. So therefore you wonder why there is not the collaboration on behalf of the customer. So my point is, mm-hmm. how do you measure that you really have the right service culture and that facilitates that Mm -hmm. breaking of silos. That's great. One of the 12 building blocks is called measures and metrics. And these are the quantitatively trackable components, whether it's percentages or ratios or or raw numbers. Um, The other in the overall feedback is called voice of the customer. And that's more the qualitative, emotional, subjective, what people write in in free text form boxes, et cetera, or tone of voice. So what you're asking about is the measures and metrics side. And what happens is KPIs get created that look like a good idea to track to see whether or not a particular department is being efficient or effective. The trouble is the moment you put those, those particular types of metrics in place, they become the target that people are focusing on. It gets even worse when you then tie their compensation to it, because then people are going to do whatever they can do, including gaming the system so that their KPI goes up, even potentially at the risk of some other department's KPIs, and the customer is almost like tertiary. You know, it's like, oh, yeah, yeah, if they get a good experience, that's fine. So then what needs to happen is someone in leadership needs to have the guts to literally be able to look at what is it that we're actually measuring? What is it that our customers actually care about? And what are, we com- what are we committed to provide for those customers? And then have those common metrics be what the organization is focusing on. Now, that may require change in practices. That may require certain types of collaboration. And most painfully, it may require abandoning certain metrics that people have become accustomed to. They become habituated to it. And they know how to play that game. 
And so if you've got your, their bonus tied to it or their promotion tied to it or their ranking tied to it, and then you take it away, you better have a pretty strong reason why and provide them with all the other cultural elements. So that's why measures and metrics is one building block, but you don't ask people to come to work in a house where there's one block. You have to have your foundation and your roof and your windows and your walls and your wires and your pipes and all of that's got to work together. Mm. Gaming is definitely very real. And mm. some of the biggest brands I've worked for did tie compensation. I'll give you an example. And it's actually from telecoms, but we won't mention the name of the company. It was no. a large client. If you go to my website, you'll figure out who they are. They had a customer satisfaction survey with 123 questions. No customer wants to answer a survey with 123 questions. In fact, the only customers who ended up using the survey were the ones that wanted to beat up this company and complain. Okay. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, on the back end, the company had tied compensation for people all over the world to specific cells within the overall spreadsheet that was generated by customers. And so everybody was gaming the system. Okay. New CEO came in. I had the privilege of working with their team. We all got together in one big room for a couple of days and said, this entire customer satisfaction survey is obsolete. What are we going to replace it with? Four questions. Four questions. Okay. What are we doing for you now that you appreciate and you want us to continue mm -hmm. or even do more of? Number two, what are we doing now, if anything, that you find difficult or problematic and you wish we would stop or do a lot less of? Okay. Number three, what are we not yet doing that you would appreciate if we did for you? Hmm. And number four, we know that we're only one of your providers, one of your suppliers. What are any other organizations that serve you doing that you think is a really good practice? And it could be a competitor of ours. It could be in a completely different industry, but you think that's a good practice that we should know about and pay attention to. Now, you think about it. What are those four questions doing? It's telling the company what to do, stop doing, start doing, explore doing. What are you going to do with all that data from 123 questions? <laughs> You're going to try to deduce what should we keep doing, do more of, stop doing, start doing, look at doing. But you've got too much time and effort. You have to spend digging through the data. Why don't you just ask your customers and listen? That takes I Yeah, and I love that even for a leader coming in, when I've come to a brand new organization and I have a team, I actually ask these questions about what was done before and what should we stop doing? What should we continue doing? So it's very relevant for leaders too. Yes. Now, what you didn't say, I want to call out, you did not ask, how likely are you going to refer, recommend the brand? Yeah. Tell me about that. Well, the net promoter score question has had it, it has its role to play. Okay. There are a couple of problems with it. One is that you can bend over backwards and spend a lot of money absolutely delighting your current customers so that they're giving you nines and tens. Okay. Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to buy more from you. It says what's the likelihood? It doesn't actually say, have you recommended any? So you can end up putting a lot of effort and money into getting that score up. And you're considering that a leading indicator of what you actually want, which is real referrals and recommendations. Or more business, like in banking, they would call that more assets under management, more share of portfolio to our company, not to other companies. Interesting, the question doesn't ask any of that. So by contrast, for example, I know the people have created something called the wallet allocation score which is very different. It says, you know, basically, what's the likelihood that you're going to bring us more of your business? Or actually, have you, over the course of X period of time, increased the volume of doing business with us? What would it take for you to increase more business with us? Uh, now we're talking about revenue and profitability and genuine customer loyalty. Not Okay, and the last problem with the MPS is obviously it's been around for so long. And one of the reasons it succeeded is because it's so simple. People can understand. They don't want to really study hard. So oh, let's do the MPS score. But your people absolutely know how to game that. If you like our service, give us a nine or a 10. 
thank you for a nine or a 10. What do I need to do to get a nine or a 10? I'll do this for you if you'll give a nine or a 10 to me. And so you literally have evaporated the legitimacy of that. And yet dethroning it, whew, that's going to be a trip. Mm. Because again, it takes courage. Yeah. Well, I will say having spent some really quality time with Bain and company friends who created NPS, exactly, and Rob Markey, that they have taken it to another level. And I think that it is important for people to understand that it is one question. It doesn't answer why. If you're just starting a brand new company and you don't know where to start, great. Start with something. But what we're talking about here is really to take it to the next level and make meaning of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what company comes to your mind that has truly transformed a toxic culture into a service-oriented one? Boy, that is such a good question. Yeah, a company that has literally accomplished a service culture transformation. Mm -hmm. Okay, I've got a good one for you. Mm -hmm. Uh, It comes back, I mean, I traveled 100 flights a year for 29 years, so it's not like when Mm -hmm. I say Singapore, I didn't go anywhere. During COVID, of course, I was glad to be able to come and sit down, but I'm back out on the road again. Um, When the country began and insurance as an industry began to evolve, many of the global brands found a home here. So you've got your Prudentials and your Manulifes and your AIAs, et cetera, that have flourished. But who was going to insure the port worker or the bus driver or the truck driver, right? I mean, this is, you know, a lower level economically that wasn't going to be profitable. And yet, what if one of those people had an accident at work? Who was going to take care of their family? So the Mm -hmm. government created an insurance company called NTUC Income, National Trade Union Council Income insurance company. And it provided this safety net for the entire nation in terms of insurance. But over the years, the affluence here has really skyrocketed. And so then people are looking from their, an insurance provider who's more contemporary and professional and has interesting advice and a little more colorful in terms of their service. But meanwhile, this particular company was government linked. It was more conservative. It had a more bureaucratic reputation. And so this insurance organization realized, hey, we got to catch up with modern times. And they literally not only just rebranded, but they reinvented their culture. In fact, their new CEO declared what he called a cultural revolution. And I had the privilege of going in and doing a lot of work with them and using all of the architecture that's in the book, Uplifting Service, those building blocks, that foundation, et cetera. And to give you an example, they needed to come up with something that we call an engaging service vision. Now, I don't care whether you call it a vision, a mission, values, credo, you know, it doesn't matter what you call it. Is it engaging? for your people? And does it drive them in the right direction? So like when Federal Express says, our blood runs purple. I mean, you can just feel it, right? Or Singapore Airlines says, service even other airlines talk about. Or the Ritz-Carlton says, we are ladies and gentlemen serving ladies and gentlemen, right? None of them actually call that an engaging service vision, but you get what I'm talking about. So you have this bureaucratic conservative insurance company, and they need a new uplifting vision. So I'm talking with the CEO and we're looking over their service standards and they're oh bureaucratic and oh. and I looked at him and I said my god these things are dead. And he immediately lit up and he goes that's it. I said what? He said that's our service vision. I said what dead? And he said no, our service vision is going to be two words, service alive. I said well what do you mean? I mean you're an insurance company. People come to you when somebody dies. He goes no 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 no. Whether they're buying a policy, adding a rider, or even making a claim, whoever we're serving, we want to serve them in a manner where at the end they feel more alive. We want our staff to come to work every day and feel like they literally became more alive. Two words, service alive. And they built the entire culture around the architecture and transformed the brand and the culture. I love that. And we could probably spend a whole nother hour on purpose-driven companies. And you bring me... lives. A lot, improving lives and and then some. Oof, that was good. Well, 
some rapid fire questions as we get to the end. So first of all, if I had tons of leaders, all business sizes in my room right now, what's the one takeaway you want them to remember? Understanding the responsibility for the development of a culture is a different undertaking than improving performance. Mm. Improving performance will come out of and through a better culture. And you can focus on improving performance and not actually address the cultural question. So for you as a leader, one of the issues is, you know, what kind of legacy do you want to leave? But also, what are you here for? How long are you here for? Is your commitment to transforming the cultural environment or are you coming in to lead a fundamental necessary improvement? They're both absolutely legitimate and valid in different parts of an organization and at different times. Now, if you go in and you improve service performance and you start to build a stronger culture around that, you can do that within any department within an organization and then let it begin to grow out from there. You don't have to be the overall senior CEO of the whole organization to start to actually improve the culture in whatever area you're in. But that distinction is not one of just two different words. Both of them require effective study. What is the best leadership advice that you've received in your career or given to others? So the difference between a leader and a manager is that a leader is helping to articulate and shine a light on and generate ambition towards something that doesn't already exist. Let, I'm going to lead you somewhere. Okay? A manager is making sure that everything that needs to happen in order for that to happen occurs. So you're asking the leadership question. And so then the fundamental is, well, where are you leading people to? What is that future that you're looking to invent or to create? And in that regard, the underlying uh, inspiration that I use for myself on a regular basis is that a life well lived contributes to the well being of others. So then, if you're a leader, are you looking to lead an organization to make customers' lives better? Are you leading your organization towards making your team and staff members' lives better? Are you leading your organization in a way that makes the community in which your customers and your colleagues all come from and live every day? Are you making the community better? Are you making the ecology or the environment better, which is obviously an issue for people alive in our era? So what's the leadership advice is, where is it you're actually leading people to? Very clear on that. And then that can help drive a lot of other behaviors and actions and inspiration for others to join you. And Simon Sinek, one of my favorites, he says, leaders eat last. I also believe with everything you just said, and leaders also need to eat. Yeah, I'm not sure leaders eat last. That that, that kind of comes from a from a background, you know, certain narrative that comes behind it. How about leaders eat with? Okay, with. And leaders need to eat too, because I've seen many places where they're not supported and, oh, that's a different episode. So yes, <laughs> leaders all around, bottom up, top down, all people uh, really mm-hmm. need to matter and feel it. And finally- And, and by the way, your, your use yes. of the word leader, we tend yeah. to think about it in terms of position within an organization chart, like you just said, top down, bottom up. Yeah. But anyone can take the lead in a yeah. situation. So for example, in all of the new online courses that we've built, the last chapter of this course is called Take the Lead, in which we provide the learner with everything they need to be able to exercise leadership, either in an individual situation, like me and the customer, or I have my team of four people, or we have a department of 40 people, or there's 400 people here in the building, so you don't have to wait, as many people say, to get the title to take the lead, Taking the lead is somebody who dedicates themselves to bringing others towards a positive. 
Yes, agree. I always say you don't need the title leader to be one. So completely agree. And last question. If you could go back in time to your younger 20-year-old self based on what you know now that you didn't know then, what would you tell younger Ron? That what you're doing does matter. It makes a difference. Feel good about it. And uh, bring your best shining enthusiasm, creative energy to the game every day. And, you know, if some people don't resonate with that at the time, that's okay. That's totally mm-hmm. okay. Don't let it dim your light. Mm. And also to younger Ron, you're going to end up in Singapore. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I'm on the planet. I'm on the planet. And what, a, what an amazing planet. You know, we're all mortal. We get this short period of time. We live in it like, uh, yeah, it's just been given to me. You know, it's all in the background. But think about oxygen. Think mm. about water and rain. Think about a plant. Think about your dogs. And your wonderful two kids. What a think life, about huh? think about what you take for granted. It's a miracle every day. Well, I do not take you for granted. I am so grateful to have you with me and for the audience to hear you. And I'm going to include your book and your website and your social channels in the show notes so that everybody can find you. I know sure. they will want to. And thank you for sharing your wisdom and knowledge today. You're very welcome, Stacey. And thank you to all your listeners. <laughs>